for their contributions to what I'm going to tell you about today. Now, because this is not a, a death by PowerPoint talk, we can reconfigure things on the fly depending on what kinds of questions you have. So again, feel free to ask. What I want to start off with is the question of what is a Laplacian? That's kind of a silly question, but it's a question I like to ask students sometimes because depending on the student's background, I might get very different answers. If I were to ask one of my calculus students or say one of my engineering students, then what they might say is, oh, you know, something that has to do with the sum of second partial derivatives. And that's what a Laplacian is. But if I ask some of my undergraduate students who are in, say, computer science, then what they might talk about is the graph Laplacian. And they might be thinking in terms of graphs. And just to recall, if I have some graph G that consists of vertices and edges, then there's something called a graph Laplacian that can be written in a couple of different ways. Maybe you've seen this before. If you haven't, that's okay. You don't need to know anything about it. You can look at it as a, a square matrix, the uh, size of the number of vertices that's given in terms of the adjacency matrix and the uh, diagonal matrix that gives the degree of each vertex. Or if you think in terms of the boundary matrix, that is tell you things between vertices and edges, what's connected to what, then it's one of these uh, BB transpose sorts of things. This graph Laplacian fuels a lot of really cool results in graph theory, combinatorics, spectral graph theory, all kinds of great stuff. Both the, the sort of classical and this more discrete math perspective, these are, these are all really the same thing in disguise. But what I want to talk about today is what is a Laplacian at a, a somewhat a deeper level, a level that connects to some things that we in topological data analysis might care about. And to do that, I'm going to talk about sheaves, which normally is a somewhat intimidating subject, but this is going to be really easy because we're just going to look at what I might call network sheaves. These are really the cellular sheaves that appeared in the thesis of Justin Curry a while back and have since found a lot of uses in other contexts. If you've never seen this before, don't worry about it. This is not going to be difficult. It's going to be really easy. I'm going to start off with a base space. This is going to be my X. It's really just going to be in general, a cell complex, maybe a, a simplicial complex for a nice regular cell complex, but it really, for 99% of what we're going to do today, it, you could think of this as a graph, as a network, as a one-dimensional cell complex that has vertices and edges, and that's, that's good enough. Okay, now there is a, you know, formally, a, a poset, a category associated with this, the face poset. And what this is, is this just keeps track of what is a face of what. So I might have a, a vertex that is incident to a particular edge. So that face relation uh, gives you the morphisms in a category if you are comfortable with that language. A sheaf, whoops, pardon me, a cellular sheaf or a network sheaf on such a cell complex X. I'm going to use script F to denote such a structure. It's really just a functor from this structure on X that keeps track of faces to some category C of data. And this data is, you think of it as sort of floating over top of X. So vertices have data attached to them. Edges have data attached to them. 
Now, for all intents and purposes, again, for 90% of what we're going to do today, this category is going to be super simple, just as easy as could be. I'm going to look at finite dimensional uh, vector spaces over some field of really, really, I'm going to use finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So I want, I want an inner product structure. I want just a little bit of geometry in there. Okay. Now, what do these things, what do these things mean? What do they look like? Well, if I've, if I've got a network and I've got vertices and I've got a whole bunch of edges, then attached to each vertex is in the context that we're talking about some Hilbert space. And I'm going to call that F subscript V. If I have a, another vertex U, then that has a nice finite dimensional Hilbert space FU attached to that for every edge that is connecting a pair of vertices. I have some data that is over top of that edge. And because this is a functor, that means I have to have morphisms that respect these faces. What are the morphisms when I'm talking about finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, of course, I'm talking about linear transformations. Now, for those of you who like to think ahead, of course, you want to think what happens when we have more interesting categories than this? Well, you know, I have objects, I have morphisms. If I think about what this looks like when I just tie together all of these chunks of data with all of these linear transformations, it gives me sort of a, a big system or a big structure. And that is what I mean by this sheaf. Now, if you're uh, trained in classical sheaf theory, you're like, what? What is this? It doesn't look like a sheaf at all. Um, think about a, an open cover, the finite number of sets, pass to the nerve, and then just push everything onto that nerve complex. And that's basically what you've got here. Can you do this with higher dimensions in the base space? Yes, absolutely. You just need to keep track of, you know, if I go from this vertex to this edge to this face, and if I do it the other way, I get the same thing. All the conditions that make this guy, whoops, that was not what I intended to do, that make this guy a functor. So that is the basic object that we are going to work with today. You might be wanting examples. I'll give some a little bit later, but there are some, there are some constructs that we're going to need before we can get to some fun examples. These are simple, but again, motivated by things that we do in classical sheaf theory. So sheaf theory is, if nothing else, all about going from local structure to global structure. The way that we've programmed this sheaf with all these little local linear transformations, we want to be able to do homological algebra with these types of objects. In particular, one thing that we care about very much are things called the global sections, denoted gamma of that sheaf. And what that consists of is choices of consistent local data. That is a terrible definition because I'm using words and not uh, symbols. So what does this mean? Well, what I need to do is I need to pick for every vertex an element of the Hilbert space over that. And for every edge, I need to pick something here, some choice of data in the stock, in that space over that edge. I need to do that for all the vertices, for all the edges, and everything needs to match up. That means that if I take this little piece of data right here and I send it, 
and I take the corresponding piece of data here and I send it, they have to match, they have to agree, they have to land at the same place. And this has to happen everywhere, everywhere, everywhere across the entire structure. These global sections also are often denoted H upper zero of F or slightly more pedantically H upper zero of X with coefficients in F. This is the zero dimensional chief cohomology, which because our choice of data category is so nice, this is gonna be really easy to define. Again, in contradistinction to uh, typical sheaf theory, what we can do is build a cochain complex by taking C0 that consists of all the data over all the vertices glom it together. I take C1, which is all the data over all the edges, glom it together. If I had higher dimensional cells, then I would keep going. And then the interesting part is, how do I relate these two with a co-boundary operator? And the way that I do that is sort of the usual way that we do this sort of thing. The formula is less instructive than a you know, simple picture where if I take the data over V and the data over U, and I look at those maps that come from the sheaf, which I don't think I gave those a name, but let's see if we have an edge E, a vertex U and V, and this is FE, then I think what I want to call these maps are F v is a face of e that goes from the data over v to the data over e that's just a linear transformation on the other side i've got u which is on the boundary of e and this map takes me from the data over u to the data over e and then what the co-boundary does when i apply it to a zero cochain <laughs> If I look at that on some edge E, then what have I got? Well, I have to look at what happens when I map things forward, I map things this way. I'm actually writing this wrong. I want to, no, I do want to keep that subscript there. Sorry, sorry, sorry. What I want to do is look at the difference between what happens when I map this from the left and then I map this from the right. As with anything else in algebraic topology, oh my gosh, I've got to come up with some way of deciding which is the positive and which is the negative. So as with defining a graph Laplacian and graph theory, you put orientations on everything and you prove in the end that the orientation doesn't matter. Okay, you can do this similarly in higher dimensions. You could do this similarly with a more interesting cell complex, keeping track of incidence numbers, things like that. But what that leads to is a definition of the sheaf cohomology, which is gonna be the kernels mod the images, same as usual. And in grading zero, that is really gonna give you the same thing as the global section for this sheaf. Okay, that is all the, the background to get us started. I feel like I've lost the thread here. What was this talk about again? This talk was about Laplacians. So let's get to that. Because we are in the very, very nice setting of a sheaf of Hilbert spaces over a cell complex, we can define a Laplacian. So because all of our data in our data category is Hilbert spaces, what I can do is I can look at this co-boundary map D and I could take its adjoint D star, which goes backwards down the cochain complex. I can define 
a what an algebraic geometer might call a Hodge Laplacian. L as being d d star plus d star d. What L is going to do is it's going to take k cochains to itself, and the theorem that kicks everything off, that is really pretty easy to prove in the simple finite dimensional setting, the Hodge theorem, says in a simple form that the cohomology of the sheaf can be computed as the kernel of this Hodge Laplacian. And yes, if you have the question, is there an orthogonal decomposition with the kernel and the image and the blah, 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 yes, yes. All those things that you want to be true work. In this simple setting, of course, things get more complicated with infinite dimensional stocks and things like that, but let's keep things simple, very, very simple. Now, I think this is really cool. Why is this so cool? Even though it's so simple, this is so cool for a couple of reasons. I'm gonna outline them quickly and then I'll dig into maybe a, a little bit more extended example. If I think about what this Laplacian could do, well, it can give me a norm on cochains. So if I talk about a, a cochain X, let's say, uh, let's say it's a zero dimensional cochain. And I define this using the inner product structure as the inner product of X with its Laplacian, then this gives me a, a distance to being a global section. So I could say, how far away am I from a zero cochain to be globally consistent? And the Laplacian gives a really easy way to, to do that and to prove that it has that property. What I can do with this Laplacian is I can take all of the work that's been done in spectral graph theory, which is just a huge industry in applied and computational mathematics, and I can lift it to questions of sheaves. We could talk about spectral sheaf theory. And this was indeed the PhD thesis that Jacob Hansen wrote at Penn. Really great thesis. So again, what does this mean? What is this about? Oh, this graph Laplacian is a matrix. So it's got eigenvalues and it's a positive semi-definite matrix. And it has properties that mystify somebody in combinatorics like, ooh, the number of zero eigenvalues gives you the number of connected components of the graph. But this does not surprise us. Why does this not surprise us? If I look at the graph Laplacian, then this is really the same thing as the Hodge Laplacian of the trivial sheaf of the constant sheaf over your graph, whereby the trivial constant sheaf, I mean, you have one dimensional vector spaces over top of each vertex, over top of each edge, and all of the maps that glue them together are identity maps. That Hodge Laplacian is exactly the graph Laplacian. So now we can extend that out to a really rich, complex data structure. This Hodge Laplacian is still positive semi-definite. So we can start proving all kinds of really cool theorems about this stuff. And in fact, if you want to see some details, I won't go over them, but you can see lots of details about things that one does in spectral graph theory, like sparsification and approximation spectral approximation that is can you take a big complicated graph and replace it with a much smaller graph where the graph laplacian has basically the same spectrum where by basically the same i mean there's a nice notion of distance between spectra 
if you've ever seen talks about expander graphs, a lot of cool stuff there. Jacob Hansen has a new paper out expanding this, pardon the pun, to sheaves, talking about expander sheaves within a sheaf over graph. So tons of cool stuff you could do there. Why else is this Laplacian so cool? Oh, this is really the gateway to being able to do a lot of distributed computation with sheaves. If you're familiar with the graph Laplacian, it's sort of locally defined. It's all in terms of the adjacency matrix, the degree matrix. Likewise, this Hodge Laplacian is a local operator. You just need to know data about each vertex and the edges that it's connected to. Let me try to flesh this out just a little bit. Here's a, here's a theorem that is easy to prove by semi-definite properties. If I take a, uh, a K cochain, so this is data over the K-dimensional cells, so think a, a zero cochain of your sheaf. And if I let that data evolve under the following differential equation, dx dt equals minus alpha Lx, where alpha is some, I don't know, let's say small positive real number. It doesn't have to be small, just positive. Then this data as a function of time converges asymptotically to the orthogonal projection of the initial condition x naught onto the k-dimensional cohomology of the sheaf. Well, what does that mean? Oh, what that means is, let's think about the case where we're at uh, grading zero. That means I could start with data over the vertices and vertices talk to their neighbors mediated via edges and what they're actually executing in this equation is a heat equation, right? Remember what a Laplacian is, second derivatives, all the good stuff. By flowing along this heat equation, this initial condition converges to a global section. And in fact, because it's orthogonal projection onto it, it converges to the closest global section. So if you have a bunch of inconsistent data in a system and you want to make it consistent, what you do is you flow by this heat equation and you will get to the closest consistent data distribution. I think that's very cool. I think that's very important. I think it's gonna be important in a lot of, a lot of different areas. For example, in optimization, there's so much that one can do with this. Let's consider the following setup. Let's say that you've got a, a graph, G, vertices, edges, all that good stuff. And I've got a sheaf, F, on this graph. Again, a sheaf of uh, finite dimensional vector spaces with bases, all that good stuff. But now, for each vertex, what I have is an optimization problem. I have some local cost function, phi sub v, that takes this vector space to the reals. Let's say that it's convex for simplicity, but not necessarily linear. Then what I want to do is not solve this local optimization problem, minimizing the cost. No, what I want to do is minimize the global cost. That is, I want to minimize the sum over all these vertices of these local cost functions. But I want to do so subject to a constraint, a constraint that is programmed into the sheaf. Namely, I want 
my choice of element in each vertex stock to together give me a global section. So I want to find the global section that minimizes the collective cost. So everyone's got their own little optimization problem, but you have to sort of reach out to your neighbors and make sure you're not messing with them too much. How do you do that? Well, to make a somewhat long story short, it's actually not all that long. What you can do is just classic methods from optimization theory. You can write down a Lagrangian using that data and some dual variables, lambda. And you could take this global cost function phi, and then I put in some quadratic elements using the Hodge Laplacian. Now, if you do optimization theory, if you teach optimization, this is totally standard. This is, this is not bad. I'm not going to go through the details. I'm going to say, long story short, if you use the usual saddle point dynamics, if you use this Lagrangian and set up a primal dual system, then those dynamics will converge to the minima, to the optima under the KKT conditions, et cetera, et cetera, optimization theory stuff. Don't worry about that. What is really interesting is that you've got this global constraint that is programmed in by the sheaf, but you can solve it using purely local operations. This is distributed optimization with a homological, cohomological constraint. These types of problems, I think, are just the beginning of what one might say is an extension of linear programming to homological programming. This is just one very, very short and sorry, incomplete example of how to use that Laplacian in an optimization setting. Okay, so that's, that's a quick run through of four different things, four different ideas why I think that this Hodge Laplacian for sheaves is really, really cool, even though we're just working with finite dimensional vector spaces, nothing all that fancy. Okay, now, what I'd like to do is one more example. And, and now that we've sort of gotten you know, a bunch of definitions and things under our belts, I want to do an example that we can go into to depth a little bit more. This is some newer work, again, with Jacob Hansen that uh, may be appearing in a SIAM journal near you sometime in the future. This is an application to social networks. And in particular, to opinions over social networks. A timely topic. Let me talk a little bit about the history of what is really a, a pretty huge field. There was some fundamental work done by Taylor in the 1970s that went as follows. He said, let's say you have a, a graph, G, that is modeling a social network. Nodes are people, edges are pairwise communication links or friendships between people. And what we're gonna do is discuss some topic. And each person has an opinion on this topic. And these opinions are real valued. So if I have some vertex V, then X sub V is going to be a real number 
And maybe it's positive and maybe it's negative and maybe it's really, really close to zero. To make this concrete without getting into politics, consider my tie. I love this tie. I chose this tie especially for today's talk. I like it so much. Most people like this tie. Not everybody likes this tie. I like it very much. You, you have your own opinion about it. Now that opinion might change over time. Maybe if you talk to everyone around you and they say, man, that was a great tie. And maybe you're inclined to like it more. Maybe you're inclined to like it less. I don't know. It depends on how contrarian you are. But in Taylor's work, what he said was, let's assume that people influence each other over the edges of this graph. And what he did was he set up the heat equation that I have already written down earlier, where this Laplacian is the graph Laplacian. And with that graph Laplacian, what he proved is that x of t converges asymptotically to a constant. This is a state where everybody has the exact same opinion about the topic. This is a classic consensus result. And so one concludes that we have proven mathematically that when people discuss topics over social networks, it just takes a little bit of time for everybody to come to consensus. Well, maybe not. And that leads to one of the the real interesting problems in this field, that is the community cleavage problem. How is it that we get these splits into two or more factions that have very, very, very different opinions about things? And that the more people talk, the more reinforced they get in their polarized opinions. This is very interesting. There has been so much work done on this, it's impossible to outline everything. I can, I can say a couple of things verbally. Tons of people have looked at uh, sort of nonlinear dynamics associated with this, things like reaction diffusion equations. People have put in all kinds of hybrid constraints. There's the Hegsel and Krauss model, which says that it, you only listen to people whose opinions are close to you. And if someone's opinion is too far away from you, you don't listen to them or you do the opposite. There's all kinds of things you could put in here. What I would like to proffer is a different model that is, I think, simpler than a lot of stuff out there once you're comfortable with some network sheaves and for which the tools that we've been discussing have some import. So what I'm going to consider is something called a discourse sheaf. F over some graph, a social network, X. And the way that I'm gonna work with this is as follows. This is gonna be a sheaf of vector spaces, Hilbert spaces, vector spaces with the dedicated basis, linear transformations, and it's gonna work as follows. So for each vertex V, I have the data over V. This is an opinion space, and it's a vector space with a basis, a basis consisting of a collection of topics. So for example, Maybe I have a couple of things that I've really, uh, you know, solid opinions on. And, uh, you know, I got this thing that I care about and this thing that I care about and this thing that I care about. And I may have a strong positive, I may have a strong negative opinion, I may have zero opinion, but I have some personalized set of basis topics 
on which I have opinions. Now you might have a very, very different opinion space, things that you care about, have thought about, that's totally cool, not a problem. If two of us get together and talk, how is this gonna proceed? Am I gonna share all my opinions about everything? Good heavens, you wouldn't want that. And I won't say how I feel about the converse, right? So let's reduce to another space, a different space, maybe a totally has nothing to do with anything I have an opinion on or anything that you have an opinion on, but we have a discourse space with some basis topics. And again, I wish we were at the conference for real because something like, hey, what do you think about going to the burger joint for lunch? That's not something that I have a preconceived opinion about, nor you perhaps. But what we do is we formulate expressions of opinion based on things like individual preferences, individual constraints, all these things that be, can be encoded in a personal opinion space. So this map that takes me from my opinion space to our discourse space is a formulation of beliefs. It's an expression of an opinion or multiple opinions, depending on the dimension of the discourse space. Now, all these abstract things that we've been looking at take on a, a certain type of concreteness that I find is pleasant to think about and to discuss. For example, if I take a zero cochain, this is really a distribution of uh, opinions, a distribution of personal opinions. If I take a one cochain, then this is some sort of expressed opinion distribution, where the former is private, the latter is public. Interesting. What does a global section look like? The global sections are quite literally harmonic opinion distributions. These are choices of personal opinions that under the expressions encoded in the sheaf give rise to harmony, not consensus. We don't all believe the same things, but we are expressing an agreeableness. Yes, yes, I think that's good about the topics that are open for discussion. And I think that this setup is a really good example for how sheaves work. Even these, these very, very stupid, simple uh, cellular sheaves. Why? Because you can really program these things to do all kinds of interesting stuff. Right? These maps are personal and they're controlled. These maps can exaggerate. For example, I might not have a real strong opinion on, you know, some topic, let's say, but I might, I might give a stronger opinion than I really feel inside. You know, maybe someone from New York City, I don't know. Or you can lie. I might believe one thing, and maybe we're talking exactly about the thing that I have a personal opinion on, but instead of sharing that opinion, I'm just going to slap a minus sign in front of it and say the opposite. And I can do so selectively. So if I'm talking to you, I might say one thing about the thing that we're talking about. If I'm talking to you, we might be talking about the exact same topic, and I might say something totally different. 
all that can be encoded selectively in the structure of a sheaf. These are very, very flexible things. Now, these are things, these are situations that people have discussed in the literature in the classic setting, but it's very futzy. It's very hard to get the program to work. Whereas in this setting, oh, it's so easy. The simple theorem that gets things going, that is a consequence of the things that we've said before, is that if we use a heat equation, something of the form dx dt equals minus alpha Lx on zero cochains, that is personal opinion distributions. Then if you want, we could do this in discrete time. I could take Xn plus one, and then I could take the identity minus some constant times the Laplacian and uh, apply that to X at time N, and then that would work, <coughs> pardon me. Then either of these will converge to a harmonic opinion distribution. independent of the initial condition. And it will converge to the closest harmonic opinion distribution. This is kind of cool. But this is just the beginning. Uh, let's keep going. And for purposes of time, I'm going to compress this out. You can take a look at the preprint that's up on website, archive, anything like that. What happens if you have people who are stubborn? If you have people who are like, they're not changing their opinion to what? They're just going to blast it out. And they're never going to change what they, what they think. Well, what one can do is just sort of zero out the heat dynamics on that set of agents. And what you want to know is what is that system going to converge to? And what that system under those heat equations, under those heat dynamics, using the Hodge Laplacian, what that's going to converge to is a harmonic, oh Lord, extension of the initial opinion distribution on those stubborn agents. And if you want to get fancy, you can use some relative zero dimensional cohomology to say whether that harmonic extension is unique or not. I'm afraid you're going to have to see the paper for details on that. And this should be agents. We can have a whole sub network of them. Does that sound nefarious? A network of agents who just keep pushing out propaganda, never changing their opinions? Well, that doesn't sound half as nefarious as this. What happens if we start doing some classic control theory? What happens if we say within my network X, I have some agents that are, that are fixed, that are stubborn, that are feeding some opinions, and I have some other agents that I want to observe and see what do their opinions wind up being. This translates to a classic controllability observability problem in control theory. And the obstruction to observability or controllability is going to be this relative H not knowing something about these two cohomology groups tells you about whether you can feed certain opinion inputs and drive the observers to have fixed opinions in a harmonic extension. This is very cool. It sounds very creepy. In practice, I don't think this would work so well. 
you actually have to know a whole lot about this system to be able to make this work. And I don't think that's realistic, but I think it is worth thinking about. But I think that all of this is relatively fanciful and unrealistic. Why? Because I've set this stuff up for you, but look, do you really think that if we get all of us together and start talking politics, that that communication is going to cause us to change our opinions and we're all going to wind up eventually expressing agreement? I don't think so. I think what's going to happen is that over time, we're going to change our expressions of our opinions while keeping our personal opinions relatively fixed. And in the end, hopefully, leading to a harmonic expression. So consider what happens when instead of putting a dynamical system on the co-chains, we actually put dynamics on the sheaves and we flow in the space of sheaves. So what I do is I set up a dynamical system where the thing that I'm evolving is the sheaf map and you write down the relative version of the heat equation and flow in this space of discourse sheaves and guess what this is going to use that Hodge Laplacian all over the place and what you will get is that this converges asymptotically to the closest discourse sheaf for which what you have is your initial opinion distribution leads to a harmonic expression. So at the end of the committee meeting, everybody is expressing agreement, but their personal opinions might not have changed all that much. Of course, you can mix these two together and have both the opinions and the expressions flowing. That's very, very interesting. What happens when you start running some simulations is, of course, if you start off with a lot of discord in the initial condition, people learn to lie. They learn to switch the signs on their sheaf maps so that we can all get along. It's for some of these reasons and more. I think that this is an interesting model to look at. And I think it provides an interesting argument for why sheaves are a really great tool for doing modeling in this setting, which is sociological enough that you wouldn't think that this type of tool would really be useful. Okay. Now we're getting near the end of the hour and you've been so patient and haven't interrupted with any questions. So I want to leave some time for questions, but I got to say one Last thing about what comes next. And what comes next is a very, very cool story where what I want to do is take this cell complex and instead of looking at data that is in this very, very simple category of Hilbert spaces, what I want is a richer structure. And so together with Hans Ries, what we have done is repeated a lot of this story for a category of lattices and connections. This is gonna be impossible to explain in detail. There is a, a preprint out, it's up on the archive. If you've not seen lattices before, Lattices consist of a set and then um, two operations, join and meet. If you want to think about a collection of subsets of a set and union and intersection, that's cool. If you want to think about a post set and max and min, least upper bound, greatest lower bound, that's cool. All these types of things. These are very, very good for encoding logical data. Boolean algebras, for example, give you lattices. The morphisms are a little bit more 
interesting and subtle. The cool thing about this is that there exists a sheaf Laplacian, a Hodge Laplacian, if you've got sheaves of these guys. That's the good news. The bad news is there's no sheaf cohomology, um, at least not beyond the global sections. Right, global sections make sense. You can take limits in this category, but uh, this is not an abelian category. So you can't do co-chain complexes. You can't do kernels. You can't do images. You can't do anything like that. But the punchline of the paper that I'm not going to have time to get to is that you can do a Hodge theorem. And you can define a type of cohomology for these sheaves, something that we call Tarski cohomology, that winds up being the fixed point set of the Laplacian uh, meted with the identity on the relevant co-chains. I apologize for not being able to tell that story in full. I want to toss it out just, just to get it out there that there's a lot more that one can do with things that initially don't look like Laplacians, but which really behave like Laplacians. And I think there's a lot of work left to be done on looking at sheaves that take values in more general categories still. With that, I'm gonna thank you for your patience and stop and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Rob. Are there any questions, comments? Trevor Karn, you have to turn your mic on maybe. I think if people have their hands up, they should just go. Okay, Antonio Reiser has his hand up. George York Essel also has his hand up. I kind of want Antonio to go first because I saw his hand first. I don't want to be rude. I don't know if his audio problems. I'm sorry, Antonio, we're not hearing. So thanks for the talk, it was really interesting. I was wondering if you could emphasize, I feel like it's, the answer to my question was already in the talk somehow, but maybe you could underline it. How uh, looking at the, these Laplacians and the Hodge Laplacians on network sheaves gives you something additional from looking at them just on graphs, or looking at the corresponding thing on graphs. Yeah, very good question. So the, Graph Laplacian is telling you something about the, the underlying graph structure, and, and that's it. The Graph Laplacian can only tell you about the graph. If you have a sheaf, I like to picture it as a data structure that's floating over top of the graph. The Hodge Laplacian of that sheaf tells you not only about the graph downstairs, but about the data upstairs and how it's connected. For example, if you look at the number of zero eigenvalues in the graph Laplacian, that tells you about connected components of the graph, right? Mm -hmm. Right. If you look at the number of zero eigenvalues for the Hodge sure. Laplacian of the sheaf, it tells you about the number of distinct connected components of global sections. You right. might have a connected graph, but with different yeah. connected components of consistent choices of data. And that's really interesting. Great, thanks. Yeah. You are Yessel? Uh, uh, hi, Th thanks so much for this fascinating talk. There's so much in here that's gonna be directly helpful to me. Um, what, what I'm interested in is basically what you discussed, except that I'm interested in the second time derivative. And so suddenly everything starts to oscillate 
Um, and the second thing that's interesting about that is that uh, these uh, cycles that our cohomology, we like to think of as obstructions, actually are the, 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 the meat of what we're interested in. So I, I thought if you had some comments about how in your work with this, uh, you, you, you dealt with cycles and how you imagine this will go if we really drive this as an oscillating dynamical system. Oh, I think that's absolutely great. And it's definitely something that should be done. There's a bunch of work in the consensus literature over graphs that instead of using heat equations, uses wave equations in order to do message passing type protocols. And I think that that would plug in really well in this framework. I've not done that, but moving to wave equations, moving to reaction diffusion equations, there's all kinds of dynamics that one ought to be able to do. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, Leland, did you have a question? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much uh, for the talk. I, I really appreciate it. I was uh, thinking about the uh, opinion dynamics and, and discourse sheaves, and uh, particularly for things like uh, online opinion dynamics, which is obviously a, a popular topic. And a lot of discussion online does not happen on a one-on-one -on -one interaction basis. There are discussion forums where you're going to be essentially broadcasting your opinion to some known select group. Now, it seems reasonable that one could model that with higher dimensional simplices or, or, or cells, but they're going to be very, very large. Is this, uh, is this a, a, a tractable way forward, do you think, or is that gonna be like computationally incredibly challenging? How, how difficult is it once you go to much, much higher dimensions for these discourse sheets? An excellent question. One of the things that I'm optimistic about with respect to this language of sheaf theory is that there's no reason why these base spaces have to be one dimensional. They can, they can absolutely be higher dimensional and all of the cohomology, all the Laplacians, they all go through. Basically no modification needed. But, hmm, I don't think it's straightforward to get this to work with realistic opinion dynamics where you've got subgroups that are talking. Because if you look at what the sheaf condition means, what it means is that, you know, to get a global section, you really only need to know the pairwise interaction. The sheaf condition imposes agreement on all the higher order interactions. That makes me a little nervous. And it makes me wonder if there isn't room for something other than a true sheaf, something where you've, you've got some mismatches on the higher dimensional stuff in order to account for the, the subtleties of interaction where you know, what we say in a group of three or four might be different than what we say when we are talking pairwise. That I think is a really interesting open question. I, I don't have a simple answer to it. Now, you were talking a little bit about the computational issues. Of course, you make the dimension high enough and phew, everything's out the window. I think where software is at right now, we're able to do somewhat realistic things, but not Twitter level stuff, not yet. Okay, Lewis, did you have a question? Yeah, um, thanks a lot. This, this talk was amazing. This is really interesting. Um, so part of my question was uh, related to what you just said. I'd like to, I'd like to have a shift that is not really a shift, but it is up to some uh, kind of errors that you control in some way. And I'm wondering if you have some idea of, of like how you want to control these errors exactly. Like the, maybe it's, it's not the shift condition, it's the functor condition that is not satisfied exactly. Mm -hmm. Is there a, like an obvious way of how to control that? Like what it means to be kind of 
Yeah, I think that I think that's really closely related to to my answer to Leland's question. I, I I think what one wants for realistic modeling is something that isn't a functor on the nose. And no, I don't know the right way to to do that and to make that work. Um, I bet there's a lot of interesting math to be done there. Right. Um, and then I was wondering if you could try to make it like have some dynamic that given something that is not quite a functor fixes those problems and you may learn something from that. I think that would be really cool. Um, and then the other question is, what if, if your maps are not linear, but are like differentiable or something? Can you approximate like a differential shift by linear ones or something like that? Oh, that is such a, that is such a difficult place to work. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm dying. I want to use nonlinear maps, but that's really difficult to make it work. That's a tough one, I think. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jesus Gonzalez, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for this great uh, talk. I was wondering, um, you've already mentioned that um, sheets of data carry some more information and interesting information than, than the uh, ground uh, simplicial complex, say. So I was wondering, since just going into the mood of uh, discretizing classical mathematics, um, would it make any sense to use discrete Mars theory to try to study all these uh, things that you've been talking about in this talk? Yeah, that's a great question. Of course, the expert in this is Vidit Nanda from Oxford. Uh, together with him and Justin Curry, we have a, a paper from some years back that used discrete Morse theory to compute cellular sheaf cohomology. So yeah, that machinery works and, and you can use that to get cellular sheaf cohomology. So the, 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 the authors were, um, who were the others? Yeah, so Justin Curry from Albany, and then myself, and then Vidit Nanda from Oxford. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more questions? Oh, there's one in the chat. There's two questions in the chat. Uh, the first of them uh, is your remark on optimization Lagrangian does not appear in your preprint on Tarski Laplace. Can you give a reference? Yeah, let me. Uh, it's going to take me a second to look this up and then I'll pop it in the chat. So give me 60 seconds and I'll take care of you there. Okay, there's a second question. Any link between your work in quantum fields and Alan? Berkian in Klein-Gordon equation. Ooh, that is out of my league. And it's hard for me to answer that while I am also looking up this paper. Darn it, where is it? Ah, I can't find it. Okay, so I'm going to try and answer this. I can only do one thing at a time. Hmm. Ooh, so... I don't know enough uh, quantum field theory to be able to say anything intelligent about this, but you know, if I think about the problems that we have with quantum computing, where you know you need a certain amount of qubits in order to make things work, and having more and more and more on a single machine is is quite difficult. There are some works out there, there are some notions out there to do distributed quantum computing, where you link together a whole bunch of different machines with different numbers of qubits. But when you do that, you've got this data that is living in the appropriate Lie group, where the, the dimension is related to the number of qubits, and everybody's got a different Lie group sitting over top of them with different dimensions. And you want to be able to get them to agree on a computation that they've done. That just from a 
you know, this is BS, but just from a hmm perspective, I would think that something like a sheaf Laplacian, a Hodge Laplacian might be helpful in that context. And I'm not sure that it's something that researchers there uh, would know to do. That's, that's about the only thing I can say there. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? Let's thank Rob again.